Hello everybody, and now we're going to look at chapter 16, pertaining to the demand for resources. So we're going to look at how resources or our inputs we use to make things are priced. We're going to go through what's known as the marginal productivity theory of resource demand. We're going to go through the, deter the determinants of that demand. How elastic is it? What is the optimal combination of resources? And finally, what is the marginal productivity theory of income distribution? So let's take a look. So when it comes to resources, there's a money income determination at play. So resources are a cost. Our resources are what we use to make something or not free. And it is our goal, if we're properly managing a company, to minimize that cost and allocate our resources in a way that is best for us. So firms want to produce at the profit maximizing output with the least co costly combination of resources. And finally, there can be policy issues. You may uh, run into things like, what are you paying your CEO? You may have union contracts uh, not allowing you to pay um, less than a certain amount or minimum wage laws. These are all things that affect resource pricing. In this chapter, we're going to focus specifically on labor resources or the people who work for our organization, but these principles apply just as well to other things like land capital and entrepreneurial ability as well. So we're going to focus on our labor force in this chapter. So if we're going to look at the demand for resources, first off, let's assume perfect competition. So resources can be bought and sold in perfectly competitive markets, meaning the hiring market is perfectly competitive and that the products that the people make, that our labor makes, are also going to be perfectly competitive as well. So a lot of times when you use economic theories, remember things are indeed simplified. So the derived demand for resources, or what is the demand for resources, is going to uh, depend on two things. What's the marginal product of that resource? Or what are they making? And also, what is the price of the product that those resources are producing? So that is going to be, that is going to be what we do when we are determining what is the demand for resources. So if we look at our next formula right here, the marginal revenue for a product is the change in the total revenue resulting from a change in labor. So if we add another worker or another machine or whatever our labor is, that goes on the bottom. What's our change in total revenue? So if our marginal revenue product is positive, it means that adding an additional unit of labor is going to make us money. It's not always going to be positive. So marginal resource cost, what's our marginal resource cost? That's the change in total cost over the change in resource quantity as well. So once again, like we did in previous chapters, we keep adding units of labor as long as marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. Or the additional product we make from that labor is more than our additional cost. And that's our theory right here. Marginal revenue of product is equal to marginal revenue of cost. We're going to keep adding labor until they equal each other. So to maximize our profits, hire additional resources as long as the additional product produced adds more to revenue than to cost. Once they equal each other, that's when we'll stop adding more labor. So the marginal revenue product schedule is your firm's demand for labor, and the marginal revenue cost is your wages. What are you paying your labor? So this is pretty straightforward. We're gonna look here. So here's the demand for labor in pure competition, uh, looking at the sale of a product. So if we look here, as we in increase our units of labor right here, if you follow the yellow arrow, output is going to go up as well. However, marginal product is going to decrease. 
you don't simply make exponentially more stuff the more people you hire it becomes diminishing returns just like anything else so total output here's our total output and if I switch to red here's our change from one step to another as we hire additional people the product costs two dollars so our total revenue is simply how much did we make times its price so here's our total revenue column here I'll switch to blue and finally here is our marginal revenue per product and that's the one we're interested in so it is simply the change from each step to another as we hire an additional worker so it's going from 14 to 12 to 10 to 8 to 6 to 4 to 2 and that's the change by adding an additional worker and an additional worker so it is downwards sloping it is downward sloping so now let's take a look here in imperfect competition the resource demand curve which is the solid line the green line is going to slope downward and it's greater than for a purely competitive seller the dashed line because the pure competitor can sell the added output at a constant price so since this is imperfect competition price is changing remember in perfect competition price stays the same individual sellers cannot set the price whereas in perfect competition imperfect competition excuse me sellers can set the price and they have to generally make it cheaper to sell more so in this case your product is getting cheaper and your labor is still diminishing returns so you are getting changes much greater changes in the marginal revenue of product right here that's the difference so in terms of resources if we look here these are the largest oil importers for example and oil is a resource that's heavily used and definitely a big determinant of cost of things uh, when gas and oil prices go up resources uh, become more expensive and products generally become more expensive as well and this is just the list as of 2020 but no matter what your resource is what actually determines its demand well up first are changes in product demand so in this case if our products becoming more popular the resources needed to make it become more popular as well so let's look at electric cars electric cars use lithium for the batteries for instance um, lithium demand has been going up over and uh, end over end the last several years as electric cars and things which utilize lithium ion batteries become more popular it is a positive change for that demand whereas if we're looking at a product which is no longer popular the demand for the resources that go into it are going to drop so changes in product demand have a big determinant of how many resources we need changes in productivity are the other one and what do we mean by this up first quantities of other resources so um, depending on if we can replace one resource we use with something else we found a, a better metal to make something or we can make a different alloy cheaper that's an example or we can use more of one and less of the other that's an example here so that can change our resource demand our quantities of our other resources if let's say we used to make our cans out of aluminum but now some other kind of alloy costs half as much and uh, it makes just as good cans that would be an example of a change in productivity quantities of other resources technological advances are a huge one um, we may invent new technologies where we now no longer need a resource that was very expensive in the past or we might need a lot less of it due to some new manufacturing process or some sort of a new technology if we make a new battery which doesn't require lithium for instance then that is going to greatly change the demand for lithium so if we make a new battery that's superior and it doesn't need lithium as part of the chemistry that would be an example here and finally quality of the resource so better quality resources generally you need less of them inferior quality resources generally you need more of them 
and uh, that's a thing here. So better quality resources, if you can get them at a decent price, are generally a very good thing. So in terms of resource demand, part two, changes in the price of substitute resources. And I touched on this before about my aluminum can example. And um, you could argue that is a substitute. Whereas if we go to the previous one, quantities of other resources, we would probably argue more so that is um, complementary resources. So if we make jewelry and we use diamonds as a resource, if the price of gold greatly changed, it's going to change our demand for diamonds. So if gold got a lot more expensive, we're probably going to order less diamonds to uh, make rings out of with the gold. Whereas a substitute resource is going to be a situation where, back to my can example, an aluminum can uh, is swapped out for one some new alloy we come up with, let's say zinc and steel or something like that, because it's cheaper and works as well. Obviously, I don't believe they're going to be getting rid of aluminum cans anytime soon, but that's just an example here. So substitution effect applies here as well. If you can swap out a resource with something much cheaper, that'll do the job just as well you would and that can have effects um, on your bottom line. The output effect indicates that a company will purchase more of one input when the price of the other falls and less when the price of the other rises. So my gold and my diamonds example. And netting the two together will determine your final total change. And with complementary resources in demand, the demand for changes in each will be directly related. So that's computers and keyboards or um, computers and flash drives or cell phones and cases or anything like that. If the price of one changes, it's going to affect the demand of the other. Price of one goes up, demand for the other goes down, and vice versa. And that's if we look here. So relationship of inputs, so substitutes in production. Um, what's your substitution effect? So uh, if capital gets more expensive, so what is capital? Remember, capital goods are things like robots or machinery that help us make products. So let's say capital goods get a lot more expensive. What do we generally do if we can substitute them? We would substitute workers for capital goods. You may not be able to buy as many robots, but you may be able to hire people to do the work of them for less. But generally what happens to output? It generally makes production more expensive, output goes down, and we use less capital and labor. So the, the demand for labor, or DL, increases if the substitution effect exceeds the output effect. Demand for labor decreases if the output effect exceeds the substitution effect. So what about complements in production? So if capital goods get more expensive and they just the capital goods and the workers complement each other, well, you can't substitute the capital goods then. Think of high-tech manufacturing where you need machinery to do some of the tasks and uh, people can't actually do them by hand. That would be a situation where they are complements. You need people and machines. In this case, you can't substitute the capital goods for workers. Whereas if we're stitching together t-shirts or something, we absolutely can. Production costs go up as well, output goes down, and less are used. So in both cases, if capital goods become more expensive, production is going down and costs are going up. Uh, demand for labor generally will decrease here because only the output effect applies. Since we're making less in the complementary situation, we're going to need less workers, bar none. So if we have less machinery, we're going to need less workers, for instance, to operate that machinery. So if we look here, determinants of labor demand and factors that shift it, uh, you can have the changes in the demand for the product itself. If gambling becomes more popular, there's more demand now for workers in casinos. If consumers uh, don't want leather products anymore, there'll be less leather tanners. So these are pretty straightforward. If the federal government increases spending on Homeland Security, there's going to be more security officers. So change in demand is pretty straightforward. What about change in productivity? An increase in the skill level of doctors increases the demand for their services. That's a example there. 
computer-assisted graphic design increases the productivity of and the demand for graphic artists. So now using CAD technology, graphic artists can do a whole lot more and it increases their demand, for instance. And change in the price of resources. If electricity gets more expensive, it becomes more expensive to make aluminum, less aluminum workers. If security equipment becomes cheaper, you're gonna probably get more security guards. Now it's more lucrative for businesses to buy that equipment and hire a security guard. If cell phones get cheaper, it's going to increase the demand for people building them. So you see that with tech products in general. When tech products first come out, they're very expensive. And then as time goes on, they get more and more inexpensive and the demand for them goes up. And finally, if health insurance premiums rise and firms substitute part-time workers not covered by insurance for full-time workers who are. that would be a different example there. They're gonna lay off full-time workers and hire part-time ones instead. And sadly, this is something that happens all too often. So what are some employment trends right now in terms of demand? So nurse practitioners, highly skilled nurses, personal trainers, fitness instructors, these are all things that are um, trending positively, health and fitness. Whereas things like telephone operators are pretty much uh, a thing of the past, there really aren't any anymore. Or parking enforcement workers, uh, that's all pretty much automated now as well. Or you have a few workers using technology to print out tickets or cameras and things like that. Uh, a lot less demand for physical people doing this. So um, trends do change and you can have situations where certain jobs are on a huge upswing in terms of demand and others are on a large downswing and they can be happening concurrently. And this is just some of the fastest growing occupations projected from now till 2030 of um, jobs that are going to increase. And here are ones we're planning to decrease. A lot of them are jobs from the past or things that have been replaced by machinery. So trends in labor change all the time. That is just a fact of life and um, something to keep in mind. So what is the elasticity of resource demand? So how elastic is our resource demand? So how sensitive is it to change in price? So it's simply the change in quantity, divide, percentage change in resource quantity divided by the percentage change in resource price. And things that determine demand are how easy can we substitute that resource? How elastic is the product? And finally, what's the ratio of resource cost to total cost? So let's go through all of these. A change in the demand for a resource must be distinguished from a change in the quantity demanded of a resource. The sensitivity of resource quantity to changes in price along a curve is measured in the elasticity of resource demand, measured as the percentage change in resource quantity or the top of our equation, divided by the percentage change in resource price or the bottom. So a change in quantity demanded is we're moving along our original demand curve, whereas a change in demand itself, the whole curve shifts. So the greater the substitutability of other resources, the more elastic the demand will be. So if we can easily replace aluminum with zinc, for instance, the demand for aluminum would be very elastic if it got more expensive. If we are a high technology company that needs lithium to make batteries, it's going to be extremely inelastic because we can't actually swap the lithium out with anything else. So in that case, that's our suitability. Since the demand for labor is a derived demand, the elasticity of the demand for the product itself will also influence the elasticity of the demand for labor. If the product is highly elastic, meaning that if the price changes, uh, people are going to not buy it anymore, swap it out for something else, that demand's gonna fall off the labor to make that product's demand will be highly elastic as well. If that product is essential, something like gasoline, the demand for workers at oil refineries is going to be very inelastic because even if the price changes, you're still going to need that gasoline. And finally, the ratio of resource cost to total cost is also a factor. The larger the proportion or chunk of your total production costs are accounted for by a resource, the more elastic the demand will be for that resource. 
So if a huge amount of your costs are this one specific resource, it's going to make it more elastic. So generally, companies will try to find their optimal combination of resources, minimize costs at a specific level. So they want to use the least cost combination of resources, make the appropriate amount of something for the least cost. So what combination of resources will maximize profit? And that's known as our profit maximizing combination and we have a rule to determine it. So we're gonna look at that now. So it's our goal to minimize the cost of producing a given output. And the last dollar spent on each resource yields the same amount of marginal product. So we want to wind up in a situation where if we divide the marginal product of labor by the price of labor and the marginal product of capital by the price of capital, they equal each other. So we want the marginal product of labor and the marginal product of capital divided by their prices to equal each other. And that's the best combination of labor goods and capital goods. We hire labor up until a point where it no longer is making us more than it's costing us, or the margin, marginal product is divided by its marginal price, and we do the same with capital goods. So we want both situations to have the appropriate amount of labor and capital goods. So each resource is employed to the point where its marginal revenue, uh, excuse me, where its MRP, or its marginal revenue product, is equal to its price. So the marginal revenue product for labor is equal to the price of labor, meaning at that point, if we hire anybody else, we're going to make more, uh, we're going to produce less than it costs us. And the same thing with capital goods. If we buy any more robots or vehicles or software or whatever we're using for capital goods, what additional revenue we get from them is going to be less than their price. So that's where we stop. We stop when they're equal to each other and we want them to equal themselves. And in this case, both need to equal one. Both need to equal one. They need to be identical and they need to equal one. So the same logic as we used in various chapters here, we acquire something until we hit a point where acquiring more of it is no longer in our interest. And the ratios in both cases equal one. And here's an illustration of that fact. So if labor is eight and capital is 12, we are going to acquire each until we hit a point where we have the appropriate amount. So at five units of labor, at five units of labor, our marginal revenue product is eight. And I'm gonna highlight that right now. So at five units of labor, marginal revenue product eight. Now with our capital goods, where is the appropriate number of capital goods? Well, our appropriate number of capital goods, they cost 12. At three capital goods, our marginal revenue product is going to be 12. So the ideal combination here would be five units of labor, three units of capital goods. In both cases, marginal revenue product is exactly equal to our costs, and I'll highlight them in red, and your cost for your labor, eight, your cost for your capital, 12. So that's what we're doing here. So in this fictitious company, their best combination would be five units of labor and three units of capital goods. Obviously, this differs from every company to company, but in this case, that would be the appropriate combination. So what is income distribution and what does that have to do with anything? We're coming up to our last three slides here. So what is the marginal productivity theory of income distribution? And it states that we pay according to value of service. So things like our workers and our resource owners. And it's not always an equal situation. Generally, productive resources are unequally distributed and markets aren't perfect. So income is distributed according to how the resources contributed to creating output. So we just distribute our income according to how that resource is uh, contributed to creating whatever output we're interested in. 
and income payments based on marginal revenue product provide a fair and equitable distribution of income. However, it is not a perfect system because you can get a highly unequal distribution. It may be because production resources were unequally distributed in the first place, and market imperfections can also result in unequal distributions. So in some labor markets, employers can use their wage setting power to pay less than competitive wages. And you can also have situations where resource owners are paid greatly more than workers and anything like that. So you can argue there is inequality. This is going to bring us to our very last slide here. So banks generally are going to use the least cost combination of resources. And ATMs only came about in the 1980s. Before them, tellers would handle cash for customers. And they were a pretty expensive labor resource. You had to hire all of these bank tellers and have them handle money and deal with customers making withdrawals. You couldn't just walk up to a machine and put in your card and take out money. ATMs came out in the 80s and they can handle cash for customers. Now an ATM is a capital good. It's a piece of equipment, it's a machine. And it's doing the work of a bank teller, which is labor. And modern ATMs can do pretty much all the work of a bank teller. You can deposit into them, you can pay bills in some of them, you can make withdrawals from them. So they can do many, many tasks that you would have originally needed a bank teller to do. So at first tellers were displaced, but today there are more ATMs and more tellers. And you could argue labor and capital are now complements. So what generally happens when a technology product comes out with a MP over P that is greater than other inputs? meaning it's making us more productive for less money. Generally, the firm at first is gonna change their mix of resources. So if that new good is a substitute, you're gonna replace at least some of your labor with that capital good. If the new good is a complement, then you will add additional amounts of that labor. So at first, ATMs displaced bank tellers, but now data shows the number of tellers have increased. So since ATMs have freed up tellers from cash handling, so deposits, withdrawals, simple things like that, the tellers can do other tasks such as selling financial products, CDs, uh, investment funds, things like that, which make the bank even more money. And you can now free up your tellers and retrain them in ways that you couldn't use them before because they had to handle just thousands of cash transactions over the course of a day. So you can argue that the capital good eventually became a complement to the labor, allowing your labor new, now to do different and additional things. And this is an argument you can make for technology uh, replacing workers that they can be complements, and sometimes they are. But look at other situations right now where McDonald's is uh, rapidly replacing a large amount of their labor force with machinery, both to make food and also the majority of registers at most, most McDonald's now are automated. You order on a touchscreen and swipe your card, and uh, that eliminated a lot of their staff. I would not argue in that situation it is a complement. I would argue that it is a replacement. So depending on the situation, capital goods can either be substitutes or complements, depending on what sort of organization we are looking at. And that's going to take us to the very end of chapter number 16.